Amazon or Instacart or any web app uh, that you know we, we use, or if it be any other product that a big company uses. For example, in our case, it will be like you know um, legal software. So let's look at the agile, right? What happens in the agile? So we define, we build, we release, but we only do small chunks. We don't do the full thing at once. So we build small units of work. You see these green cells right here. So we deliver them to the customer, and then they'll look at the small units of work that was delivered. You know, the small functionality, let's say shopping cart. They will say, okay, this looks good to me, or maybe they'll have some other feedback. You know, change the alignment of it, and then we'll take that feedback. We will include it in the define phase of the next you know cycle and then we will build uh, um, another functionality on top of it like let's say if i add a product to the shopping cart i should be able to see the price of the item right so we will do that here and we'll give it to them and then so there are multiple you know uh, ways for us to collect feedback from the customer before releasing it so we are able to keep the company. We are able to keep the cost lower while providing the value to the customer incrementally. So this is like the major difference between waterfalls and the child, right? <coughs> so this is exactly my sentiment. This is how I used to feel when I was in a waterfall project because it's just too much work. It's just not that you do, you know, as a test engineer, you just write the test cases, you write your automated test scripts. It, it doesn't end with that. You know, there will be plenty of documentation to maintain throughout the project. You know, for internal audit, for external audit, for every phase that you saw back there in the previous slide, like define phase, there will be some documentation. That's not like directly related to the project, right? It could be for internal, external audit purposes. You know, we'll spend so much time doing daily status reports, weekly status reports. So there's just too much work. That's why the guy feels bad. All right. Let's say, right, like, okay, agile, now what? How do we make this all work? Let's look at a practical example. <coughs> so in a, in a Scrum, like basically Scrum is a model of agile. It's a software, it's the same software development methodology, I, sh I should say. There are some themes, you know, that use um, Kanban, but um, yeah, so Scrum is widely used. So there will be a theme or an epic. Let's say it, the product owner comes and says, my customer um, wants a search capability. That becomes our epic, okay? So can you do anything about it, right? Like, he just says search, like how am I going to code and write tests for the search? So we start breaking down that particular epic into workable units. So the next down will be features. We will start breaking down the search theme into different features. So what can be there in the search theme? When you go on to Amazon, you search for product, right? So let's say basic search and uh, advanced search. Okay, basic search will let you just search by product name. Advanced search could let you search by product name and you can also sort by price let's say low to high or you know you can filter by price and all that so we will break that into two different features okay that's still at this level and then under each feature we will have several backlog items right okay basic search that doesn't mean anything to the developer you know they don't have anything yet to work on and then we'll start breaking them into product backlog items. So throughout this journey, we will be working with the product owner. The development team will be working with the product owner to break this all up. So let's say the basic search can have multiple user queries. So one of them can be, as a user, I should be able to search using product name. <coughs> all right, let's take that and uh, let's go out and break that into workable chunks. Let's you know, put tasks under them. So what, you know, how can you go about building a web application? So <coughs> in the three tier architecture, we have a database layer, we have services layer, and then on the top we have the presentation layer that the customer sees in the end. So I should be able to build all these, right? I should be able to build all these. And each of these layers should communicate with each other. Only then, the customer would see something flawlessly on the user interface layer. 
taking a forehead and um, you know, uh, split that into that. So the UI search component, let's say we want to build the search capability. Right? We want to build a search bar. Um, how big the search bar should be, what color should it be, you know, all that goes into the UI search component. You'll have to build a presentation layer. There are many, you know, some um, libraries available to do that. Angular is one of uh, the famous ones that uh, most companies use. And then we will have to write service layer code, right, to connect with the database search query. So the database architect will write search query. So let's say user searches for Apple iPhone, you know, um, the search, the query will run in the background. It will search all the related information from the database, all the search results for Apple iPhone. And then it will have to give it back to the service layer. And then the service layer will send it back to the presentation layer. And then they'll have to build connectivity between all these layers. Of course, the exploratory services, right? Like as the engineers, they would like to go in and do all sorts of things, like break the system, that's, that's the goal, you know? Try and search for Apple iPhone, try and search for Samsung, you know, try and search for maybe diapers. So, you know, it, it should work. Everything should work. And then there could be bugs that come out of it. Could be you know, when I search for Apple iPhone, I see something completely irrelevant that I don't want to see. So that's the bug. You know, there could be a bug. We write that in the system. We record it in the system. And then, of course, the automated integration part. Because in a scrum environment, we want to use this to automate everything. Okay? Because the time is very limited. So how we pick and choose what we automate. Automate in the sense, um, you know, like we just simulate what a end user does. End user a customer does. So the customer will like open up a browser, let's say Chrome, and then they will type www.amazon.com, right, the URL. And then let's say the login page shows up. They'll have to enter the username, password, click login. And then, you know, on the home page, they will see a search bar. They will have to enter a text and then again click. And then they will start to the result. So this is a workflow. And every time, if you have to do this manually, think about the amount of time it will take if we have to test all of the workflows in the system. That's where automation comes in the picture. So we have variety of tools available in the market to choose from you know, for our needs, which will automate this entire workflow. The machine is just going to pick up a browser. It's just going to enter the URL for you. Um, without being a human person, these workflows can, you know, can run anywhere, like for us it runs in cloud, you know, one of the cloud systems. So, you know, that's what automate, automated tests do. So before we jump into more details, um, let's see how we operate uh, in a Scrum model, right? Don't let these uh, charts scare you, you know, uh, um, just don't look at them for a moment. So we start our, uh, you know, our we have sprints, what we call sprints. So we operate on one to three weeks of studies, right? At the end of the third week, uh, we present the functionality to the customer. The first day of the first week, we start, we start planning what we are going to deliver at the end. So that's what we do in the sprint planning. We will have many product backlog items that you guys saw in the previous slide. You know, the product owner will prioritize them. That I need this for sure at the end of the third week because my customer is waiting for this. So we will start prioritizing everything. That's what we do in the sprint planning. We take up maybe a few product backlog items for us to work on. And then after that, every day we will have a standard meeting. Like we'll talk about what we did yesterday, uh, what are we going to work on today, and do I have any block with it. So it's just a short everyday meeting. And then we will have like these weekly backlog grooming sessions. So, you know, we, we also need to focus on the future, right? Like what um, uh, use of stories of the product backlog items uh, that the product owner is wanting to uh, give to the customers like the functionality that he wants to give to the customers in the future. So we will, you know, discuss about that as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, at the final day of the third week, we will do a sprint review session. Nothing but whatever work that we did, we will show it to the other departments or show it to the customers. We just brag about all that, uh, you know, work that we did. 
and then we will have a retrospective season, right? Retrospective is nothing but, you know, what could I have done differently in this sprint? Um, you know, whether did I have good uh, team coordination? You know, what are some of the pain points that, I, that we can address as a team so we can, you know, improve our next sprint, right? Like nothing comes out if, if people are just, you know, doing their business and not, you know, you know, working with each other, nothing good comes out of it. So retrospective gives us a chance to open up and talk about the concerns that we had during the sprint. Of course, I mean, you, you can have concerns every day, but this is just dedicated um, meeting and we will have action items coming out of it. Maybe we should do stand-up meetings for like only five minutes, taking up too much time, right? So that can be one of the feedback. So all this, this is this is how we operate in a scrum model. Okay. So this is all we spoke about. And then of course there is a scrum master. He will, he or she will, you know, host all of the meetings here. So the first scrum master does. We'll have a delivery team. This is our development team, and we'll have a product owner in all of these things. And this is nothing but like you know, on the first day of the uh, first week, we had so much work, and then we started working on them. We see a dip. Oh, here something happened, the service, you know, the line is flat, maybe we, we didn't finish something and then it started going down. So this is just to keep track of whether or not we are heading in the right direction. <coughs> All right. So you will, uh, you know, see the word environment used in many projects, right? Like whichever company you work, you decide to work for in the future, uh, a software company, of course. So they will have many environments. So you know, Amazon, let's say like a developer goes and he works on the coding. He's not, he or she is not going to code and then straight away the code is available to the customers, right? That's not how it works. So we will have environments within our organization, um, you know, through which the code will travel. So, you know, before it goes on to deeper environment, right? There could be a development environment. There could be a testing environment, there could be a pre-production environment, and then finally the code will be pushed to the customer. So here, before everything starts, let's say a group of developers are working on their code, and then, you know, they will check it into a repository, right? Like a source control system. Because, you know, next day you don't want your laptop crashing and all the work that you, you know, did go away. So everything gets checked into a repository, and then what happens after that? Let's say 10 different developers are checking in 10 different codes, it will get all merged together. And it has to work together, right? It has the solution has to be built. Um, you know, whether it's a Java or a C sharp or whether it's Angular code, everything has to come together and compile. So they do that. Um, and then that particular code will be pushed to the environment, right? So if you look at an environment, an environment could have an application server, it will have a database server. The application server will run the server side code as well as the UI code, right? The server runs the code. That's where the application will be deployed. To. It's just like, you know, all you see is with a bunch of hardware here. And then this will have a URL, let's say Amazon.com slash dev for development environment. And then a set of tests will run after a new code has been deployed to this environment. Why do we need to do that? Because we need to ensure that the code did not cause any breakage in the system. What if, if you know, someone pushes something like a new code and I'm not able to go to the home page of Amazon.com. All hell breaks loose, right? So there will be build verification tests. That's what we call build. After a build is done, we will verify the build. It will be a set of automated tests. It will just go, you know, log in into the system, make, go to all pages, make sure nothing, you know, bad is going on, nothing catastrophic has happened ever since that developer pushed, pushed it. So we run build verification test, and then, okay, all is well. The code is good to go to the next environment. Then we will, the code will be pushed automatically to the testing environment. And uh, this is the same kind of infrastructure. It will have a server, it will have a app server, database server, everything, you know. And then it will have a URL also, right? Let's say Amazon.com slash QA. It could be the URL of the system. Here we will again run the build verification test. And then we will run what is called regression test. Regression tests are nothing but we want to make sure all of the old functionality is still working 
even though there is new functionality available. We don't want to break any old code, right? It should function the way it should be. Um, you know, the home page should still be visible. I should still be able to log in even though the developer had pushed a search functionality existing on only to work. So we will run regression tests like uh, several times in a day uh, you know, in this environment and then the manual test engineers, they will perform exploratory testing in this environment also. So once everything looks good, you know, we will give a green light, it's good to go and then the code will move to a pre-production environment. <coughs> That's where the product owner goes in and uh, makes sure the functionality is what the customer needs. So that will be done and then finally the code will be moved to the customer. So all this, right, the code, developing the code, moving them to the environment, all this happens during the three weeks uh, sprint schedule that, you know, I talked to you guys about in the previous slide. So this is what we do day in and day out, right? Like we write tests, uh, we run tests, you know, we test everything out and then it will be uh, the code just keeps moving. So there are many tools available to do this. You don't have to push the code yourself or even, you know, a system engineer does not have to do it themselves. So that's why we have, you know, continuous integration, continuous deployment, build tools available in the market. So you would have heard um, VSPS, right, which goes to the European services. Um, there are some tools, you know, that other teams use uh, called Bamboo, Jenkins. So there are many continuous integration, CI, CD is what we call, right? So those are the tools that, that, will, that will have your code, that will build your code, and then, you know, we could run our tests maybe like on cloud, it could be, it could run on Azure, it could, it could run on AWS. Um, so, because organizations don't want to take the cost of maintaining all the infrastructure, right, all the machines, because they have to patch the machines. They'll have to pay for, you know, IT to maintain those machines. So that's why everybody uses cloud these days, uh, as you guys would have heard and, uh, you know, learned. So we delegate that responsibility to someone else. So yeah, so all this is, all this is just goes on. So let's jump into our main topic, automate, right? Of course, we want to automate. That's the only way we will be able to deliver the value to the customer's faster. Um, if I sit and do each and everything manually, I'll never be able to test everything. So there are plenty of automation tools available to let us uh, automate at the presentation layer, like what the user say. Uh, you know, like I said before, you, know, you can go to a browser, you can open up a new URL, put a new username, password, perform search. The tool can do it all by itself. You just have to write code for it. It will do it all by itself. And then, but it, it still takes time because it has to go through the user interface layer. So that's where the API automation tools come into picture. So let's just avoid the presentation layer for a moment. You know, let's just automate at the API. What does that mean, right? So we will have services layer available. So there will be, let's say, if I want to search for something, my user interface layer will have to ask for the services uh, from the service layer. So, you know, this is search. I want you to give me all the data relevant to the search. So there will be a service written in the API layer, you know, that will work with the database layer to get you the data back. So the code that we write for the API automation test is nothing but we will just hit that service directly. There will be an endpoint, right? Let's say Amazon.com slash search. So there will be client. There will be an automation client that we will have to create in our code. The client will act on our behalf. We need a client to talk to server. We cannot just talk to server directly. So the automation client will be created, and then the automation client will ask the automation client to go hit this particular search, and then it will send the response back. We will extract the data in the response. We will make sure that the data is accurate, that the fast. So this is much more faster because we are avoiding the presentation layer altogether. And um, yeah, it's, um, it, it, it's easy to automate at the API layer. Uh, Obviously, you know, it's like, Obviously, you know, it's you know, service side language knowledge, C sharp, Java, Perl, you know, Python, Ruby, whatever. So we need a, because this is written in one of those languages, right? So what does the test case look like? So this is what we do, like when we want to test something, like I said, logging, 
Uh, these are the step-by-step -step instructions that, will, that we will document ahead of time for mostly the exploratory sectors to work. So this is how it looks like and this is what will be automated. So there are plenty of tools available. So these days, you know, there are all, it's all web, right? Like whether it's shopping, build or shopping or whatever. It's all done through a web app. So Selenium is a famous tool. Uh, it's open source, which means free of cost. Uh, anybody would be able to download it. If you decide to go ahead and download it, you know, um, Eclipse, Java Eclipse is a free uh, IDE or Visual Studio Code is a free IDE. So you can use Selenium, you can start writing code, you know, you can automate the Google homepage. So feel free to do that if you would like. And then for uh, API testing, there are, there are like some frameworks really available. Karate is my favorite one, Give what? The author is, uh, resides in Bangalore. He works for a company called Intel. He is the author of this famous tool, Karate. Uh, it's not a martial arts karate with the name of the framework we use it uh, you know it's, it's very handy uh, lossless code is required for us to get a test working so i recently implemented it uh, back here and um, it's a hit so you know do check it out you can just go to karate institute.com slash karate and you'll find plenty of resources as to how it is done and then there is c-shop risk shop risk shop is a risk client because you know you need a client that has to act on behalf of you and then this is written in C-Shop. So, but uh, there's a lot of coding required to make this work. Um, and then in Java world, there's something called a Risk Assure. It's also a framework that has a Risk client that lets you create a client and talk to the server and all that. And then if we have to automate, let's say, desktop or Windows application, for example, Payment, PowerPoint, those are some of the examples of Windows apps, right? So, you know, these, there are some of those available to do that also. But, um, yeah, and then, you know, of course, mobile automation is much more uh, required. I'm a bridge, iOS, Android, APM is a famous tool uh, that has So we'll have to bring it all together. So in the project, there could be a web app testing, there will be API testing, there, there can be Windows desktop application testing, there could be mobile application testing. So all of these tools will reside within a framework, right? So let's uh, see how, like, uh, you know, the UR automation tool works, okay, if she saying Selenium, what does that even mean, right? So don't let it, you know, uh, overwhelm you, it's, uh, it's just a simple client-server concept, that's all there is to it. So we will have Selenium client libraries which are written in Python, C Sharp, Java, somebody has written it already, right? And they made that API available, so you just need to download that library, let's say for, you know, you want to use Eclipse for Java, you want to use Visual Studio for C Sharp. So you download that particular API. I'm going to go with C Sharp because that's my platform. So I have my C Sharp library downloaded in Visual Studio. And uh, now I can start writing code for it. Um, but how does my code interact with the browser? Because the browser needs to open up the URL. How is it being done? That's where the server comes into picture. There will be a driver server that will open up on your machine, it will run on a, you know, let's say, uh, I don't know, it could be different in each machine, it, it runs on a port on your local host, and it will start to, you know, listen to the instructions that the code is sending to it. Okay, the code is asking me to open the URL, let me go ahead and work with the browser to open the URL. So, whatever command that you send, it goes to this Selenium server, and then the server will send it to the browser and then under the covers like behind the scenes the mode of communication between the code and the server and the browser is called json json format okay and then this is the server that i was talking about the browser drivers because there's plenty of browsers available right there's chrome driver there's firefox internet explorer so we will have servers dedicated for each of those different browser types and um, you know let's say in my case i'm using chrome driver so my c sharp selenium code will send instructions to my chrome driver and then the chrome driver will invoke the chrome browser it will start running my test that's all there is to do it's a simple client server concept so here so this is how the sample code could look like this is not my own code um it's um 
it's just like in uh, plain you know vanilla format i just wanted to show you how it looks so you know you will want to open up the driver right driver in the sense the server so you will say driver new chrome driver give me a new chrome driver right here this is how it looks like and then please max driver please maximize my chrome windows and then you know once you find uh, the login please enter admin in the username so all this that you see here by id login name this is nothing but a html right like if you go to the chrome browser right click on it do it well um a develop bring up a developer tools you can inspect the whole uh, html of the page so we go off of base of that As for each and every element like every control that you see on the page there is a corresponding html attribute to it that you will be able to identify the rename should be able to identify it right so we go off of the html like we use id we use our css to find an element on the page you know and so on we can use the path Uh, but that kind of behaves uh, differently in different browsers. So we rely on CSS, ID, name, attributes of HTML to find elements on the page. So we do that, and we want to wait for the home page to appear, right? We don't want to go and say, "Oh, search bar is not visible," because we are not waiting for it. So we ask the driver to wait for some time, and then you know we go ahead and finish our workflow. And at the end, we just close the driver. We have done our test. You know, our test passed. if it fails you know it's going to take a screenshot so you can actually look at it later so this is what a ui automation for example so let's go to the api automation layer like i said we need a client to talk to the server so the any api automation framework that we use be it, be it karate be it rest assured it will let us create a client okay and that we will have to pass the authentication right we'll have to pass through the authentication we need to be able to access the system so we do that and then our client will start sending requests it will just hit an endpoint endpoint in the sense it will hit a url if that url is publicly available and payload right like we along with the url we'll have to send the in the body of the request what Search we need to perform. Let's say Apple iPhone. We send that in the body of the request, and then it goes to the server. The server talks to the database. It gets you the response payload back, right? So you have the response. Often, you know, it could be XML, it could be JSON. You know, our tool, the automation framework that we use, it will let us look through each of the response. We'll make sure that the data is accurate and the test passes. So. this is how we avoid the presentation layer and talk to the services layer directly which makes our life much more easier because these tests run faster they can provide faster feedback whether or not a functionality is working on it but then automation pyramid what you see here is the typical pyramid we call it an automation pyramid without an automation pyramid we able to do do our testing in an automated agile environment why because we are not going to be able to automate everything at the presentation layer like i said it's it's hard to do that because there's a lot more uh, things that you need to add as far as coding is concerned and um, it runs slowly and most of the times it is soft and break because you know there could be network issues latency issues the browser is not coming up on time so your test can't find the search bar so all that uh, you know happen at the ui test layer that's why what this this pyramid mean it means the, an application will have a lot and lot of unit tests available and the number of api tests that you write should be minimal right uh, it should be less than the number of unit tests and then the number of ui tests which are the presentation layer tests should be very very minimal it should that's why it's on the top of the pyramid it's very minimal so what makes up most of the pyramid the unit test because unit tests are just testing the unit they are really really fast they don't care about integration right um let's say there is a search bar right how would you write like an angular unit test for it uh, you will want to make sure the search bar appears in the component because all of these are embedded in a component like in a ui component there could be a search bar there could be a search icon you know there could be like type here that text could be there as part of the search bar so the unit will test the individual unit test will test the individual unit test 
can I see the search bar? Am I able to is the click functioning? You know, all that. It can be tested with the unit test. So we rely on them. And every time a developer checks on something, all of the unit tests will run. You know, it will break then and there if there is something wrong. So the developer will have time to go back and fix what they broke and then recheck stuff in. So we take care of, you know, most of the testing here in this layer because it's, uh, it's faster because it's not going through the testing layer and then reporting that it's not working. So then and there the developer gets the feedback. And then of course, these are the API tests that I was talking about earlier, Karate, Rest Assure, all that good stuff. And then the UI test, Selenium is what we use for the UI. Exploratory testing is nothing but, you know, like the manual testing that we do. So yeah, so like you see this arrow, it indicates that as you go up the pyramid, the cost of creating the test goes up. The maintenance is, you know, more because, you know, there are more, like I said, there could be more breakages in this layer. So you'll have to constantly look at what is wrong with my test. It's working, you know, in my local environment. Why is it not working in the cloud? Like when the tests run in the cloud, right? So why is it breaking there? So there will be, you'll have to spend a lot of time looking at what went wrong. And the execution time is also high. The fragility is nothing but the test break, right? But that's the fragility aspect of it. And then, of course, they test more things. So the coverage is more. So yeah, so that's why, like this is how a typical uh, automated testing framework should look like in a Scrum environment. Lot more unit tests. You know, even in future, if you join a project, or, you know, encourage your developer to write more unit tests. So that's, that's about the slide. This is nothing but, you know, like it, it might it might scare you because it has all these icons and all that. It's just, you know, what, what we call the DevOps pipeline. It's nothing but how the code moves through from the developer environment all the way to the customer. Yeah, so the developer pushes code. It's pushed into an Azure repository and then it gets built together and then, you know, releases will be created. You know, it's nothing but a version of code. That's it. That version of code will be deployed to different environments. So this is when, when you know, if anybody's talking about DevOps pipeline, this is what they mean. It's just code moving through different environments. Okay. So, you know, in the pyramid, I showed something called as uh, in the end to end scenarios, right? End to end scenarios are nothing but like a user journey in the application. So the user logs in and then they do some workflows, right? Like they search for something, they add an item to the cart, they check that out, you know, they finish the order. That's the workflow. So, you know, there could be different workflows like this, right? The customer would be searching something, adding it to their wish list, you know, that's the workflow. So we should be able to determine what the user is doing in the website, right? Only then you will be able to test. You don't want to write tests, you know, for the functionality that is not being used by the customer. You're not getting any value out of it, right? You're wasting your time. So the end-to-end -end scenario um, should be, we should be able to capture the user journey in the application, right? What workflows the user does the most? So how can you do that? Of course, you can talk to customer like the product owners, but that's not very viable, right? That's where the analytics tool comes into play. So there are analytics tools such as Google Analytics, Fendo, you know, it can be built into the UI code. It can, you know, it can send us insights back as to what is being used the most. Is the customer clicking on this button the most? You know, um, are they using one functionality over the other? So all this, we will be able to gain insight throughout. <clears throat> and then, you know, uh, we look at those insights. I look at those insights personally, and then, you know, I can come up with end-to-end -end scenarios. So I'm not wasting my time testing something that the user is not using. So it's most often automated at the, at the presentation layer because that's what the user sees, right? So yeah, so th this is how we approach our end-to-end -end scenarios testing. Oh, sorry, there's just an animated picture there showing end to end. Finally, I would like to touch upon performance testing because that's one of the automated testing means as well, right? Let's say Amazon, it's a very popular website. You know, there could be plenty of users using it, you know, um, around the world or around the country. We want the server to be capable of responding to every single request. Yes, you know, 
I am going to be frustrated if I see uh, it's taking longer for me to see the search results, right? After I enter something in the search part, I should be able to see it with a reasonable amount of time. So that's where performance testing comes into picture. So we simulate the load as though thousands of users are accessing at the same time. How does our app server um, ab or is it able to respond? You know, does it? Um, what is the response time of the request and response? The whole cycle, the request comes in, the server has to talk to database, the queries have to run, and then it has to give the data back. So that's one request response cycle. So how soon is it coming back? Is it three seconds, four seconds? You know, there will be. Uh, those will be established by the product owner. I want my customer to be able to see the search results within five seconds, within ten seconds. So we have a lot of performance testing tools available to do that work for us as well. So how fast or slow the system responds under load. So you know we have popular tools such as Neo Load, JMeter, Load Runner. We will be able to simulate virtual users. They're not real users, they're just machines, right? Or it could be, diff you know, a lot of threads on your same machine. It will just bring up, you know, a lot of sessions. It will put load on the system, and then I think it will increase the load on the system by simulating more users and see if the server can maintain a decent response time. So that's what we do in the performance testing. So this all, this all happens within that one, two, three week period. So yeah, so that pretty much wraps it up. I finally, I believe I have some tips for you. Um, 